Hello everyone and welcome to this special live edition of Insightfully Speaking, where today we'll be looking at the question, is Spiritism a religion? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Adam Osborne from Kardec Group in the UK. And now Kardec Group runs two Spiritist groups, the Spiritist Society of Windsor and Maidenhead and the Spiritist Society of Bista. And we are also the organizers of the Spiritism X events and, of course, the Insightfully Speaking podcast, where we look at the world from a Spiritist perspective. And so you can find out more information about Kardec Group, our studies, Spiritism X, Insightfully Speaking, and also our fundraising campaigns on the Kardec Group website. Let's just bring that up. So you can go to www kardec.org.uk to find out all the information about us. Or you can also go to our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. You can find Kardec Group there. And you can always contact us by email at insightfully at kardec.org.uk. And of course, if you are following us on social media, please remember to like, follow, and subscribe when you can. Now, those of you who have seen or followed Insightfully Speaking before, might be wondering where my two co-hosts, Anne Sinclair and Umberto Schubert, are. Well, don't worry, they are with us today as panellists for this discussion, alongside our guests, Andrea Marshall Neto, Roberto Watanabe, and Tanya Moore. So, what is this discussion that we're going to be looking at today, and how will it work? Why are we looking at this question, is spiritism a religion? Well. This has come about as there are many different spiritists and spiritist groups around the world who see spiritism from, a, from different angles. In some countries, it is regarded as a formalized religion, and in other countries, as any religious con connotation is generally not accepted. One part of the issue is that the word religion for most people in many countries, especially in Western cultures, is a direct indication of a formalized dogmatic faith, such as Christianity, Judaism, Sikhism, Islam, where there are traditions, rules, rituals, priests, special objects. And another part of the issue is that many people relate religion, especially in spiritism, to being a form of, of Christianity itself. But why does it matter if spiritism is or isn't seen as a religion? Well, it has been a concern for groups in different countries when they want to register themselves with their local authorities. In some countries, the authorities see spiritism as a religion, and this makes it difficult for groups who see things differently. And likewise, in countries where groups want to be registered as, uh, as a religious organization, they also face difficulties in being accepted this way. So during this event, I will be asking our panelists a series of questions which will help us gain rational insights regarding the main topic. And of course, we'd love to hear the thoughts and comments of all those joining us live today. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, please make sure that you use the comments or chat section, the live chat on on YouTube, which is just on the side, or the comments below if you're on Facebook, or you can email us at insightfully at cardec.org.uk. The details are there on the screen again for you. And of course, if you have any relevant questions for the panelists, please send them to us as well. But remember, if you're watching us at a later date, we won't be able to read out your questions or comments. Okay, so that's enough for me for the moment. I think we can start to bring on our guests. How, how about it? So let's bring them on in alphabetical order. So we have with us Andrea from the USA. We have Annie from the UK. We have Umberto from Brazil, Roberto from Brazil, and Tanya from Ireland. So. I'm going to ask each of them just one by one, just to say quickly who they are, whereabouts they are in their respective countries, and what they do within Spiritism. So just a couple of seconds each one. So Andrea. Good evening, Adam. Good evening, everyone. I am Andrea Marshall Neto. I am here in Miami Beach, Florida, United States. And we are uh, workers of the Spiritist Federation of Florida. And we are also participating in the dissemination of Spiritist titles through Leal Publisher and Fed Publisher. It's truly an honor to be with you today. Thank you. 
Thank you. Annie. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Anne, Anne Sinclair. I'm based in Hertfordshire, which is just uh, north of London in the United Kingdom. And uh, I, I have been studying spiritism for over 30 years here in the United Kingdom. And I've done many different things. Uh, lots of people know me from translating live Divaldo's talks when he used to come to the UK. Uh, but uh, I'm very interested uh, in studying all this more and participating in different activities. Thank you. Humberto. Dear fellows, I'm always delighted to join this team in very inspiring conversation. Uh, I'm speaking from Juiz de Fora, Brazil. It is a relatively small uh, city uh, in countryside uh, Brazil, near to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, I'm also uh, uh, involved in, in many groups and activities, but uh, uh, I think my main uh, activity regarding spiritism is writing. Okay, thank you. Roberto. Hello, everybody. I'm Roberto Watanabe from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I'm the president of the Sao Paulo State Spiritist Federation. Glad to be here with you all. Thank you. And finally, Tanya. Hi, I'm Tanya. I'm based in Dublin in Ireland at the moment, uh, normally down in the southwest coast. And uh, I participate in the Spiritual Society of Ireland coordinating uh, study groups. Perfect. Well, thank you all for being with us today. And so let's get started with the first question. And like I said, we have various questions. The questions may be seen as a little bit polemic, even provocative, but it's there just there just to instate a bit of conversation between all our guests today. So the first question is, can you give your personal answer to the main question, is spiritism a religion? And can you spend just maybe one minute giving a brief reason as to why you feel that way? Let's start with Andrea. Sure. Um, well, a personal opinion is yes, it is a um, religion. And I can only uh, go by this personal aspect because I learned about spiritism when I was 14. And um, I was introduced to God and Jesus and the aspect of religiousness very differently in Brazil in such a way that it wasn't inspiring and it didn't answer a lot of the questions that at a critical age, when you're 14, you're seeking. Um, and so I uh, coincidentally befriended some uh, uh, friends in the school that I started studying whose mother was directing a spirit to center. And uh, I used to go every weekend and on Sundays, and I started learning the basis um, of spiritism and started viewing God as a truly paternal being and not one that was punitive and judgmental based on what I had learned in Brazil. And I started also seeing Jesus as that uncrucified friend that Joanna Angelis, the spirit author, talks about the psychotherapist, the friend, the doctor who comes to us when we so desperately need. Of course, we can talk about spiritism being a religion because it does uh, address the aspect of God, the soul, the future rewards, punishments, and what have you. But unless we are able to connect within this knowledge, it wouldn't be a religion, which is why, in my opinion, spiritism is a religion. Thank you. Anne. Let's go to you now. Yes. So um, my my quick answer is I am I don't think it's a religion. I think it's a philosophy, and the way I, I view that is it's not that I'm not a, a religious person, or uh, it's just that my when I say the word religion, and I look in preparation for this also, I looked at so many dictionaries definitions, and what comes up time again is what generally we feel about what is a religion, an organized religion, an institution with the rules and regulations, as Adam was saying earlier. So in that sense, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a religion, but it, it is a, it's a philosophy. And it's a philosophy that is open to any human being, to anybody in the planet. And I think that religion, well, maybe this is my own culture, 
it has brought such division uh, across the world, so many difficulties, so many wars, that just that very word, it, it, it makes me tremble sometimes and perhaps I put it aside. So it says more an invitation, let, let us study, let us learn about our human condition. And um, that's why I think that spiritism uh, is a philosophy rather than a religion. Perfect, thank you. So next up is Umberto. Well, I, I think it is a very difficult question and uh, I, I do not actually feel comfortable in saying and asserting that spiritism is or is not uh, a religion. Uh, as I understand it, I, I tend to, to believe that it is not, but uh, as it happens with Plato, for example, who also speaks a, a lot about God, uh, uh, about morality or about the immortality of the soul and the afterlife. Uh, I think that uh, spiritism similarly uh, is uh, mainly interested in uh, things, uh, aspects of life that we usually regard as religious. So therefore, uh, we, we cannot um, uh, cut off the, the religious aspect of, of spiritism. We, we have to understand that uh, spiritism has uh, deep roots uh, in, in these aspects of uh, human life, uh, while at the same time, it is uh, essentially a philosophical understanding and attitude that is quite independent from uh, institution uh, and, and formal uh, attachments to a creed or, or to a dogmatic body of beliefs. Okay, thank you. Roberto. Well, Adam, the, the answer to this question depends on how you define the religion, right? Um, if we, we think about the essence of a religion, then I would say, yes, spirit is a religion. If we look at uh, what Emmanuel, the spirit Emmanuel says in, the, in his book, Emmanuel, uh, he says that the religion is a divine feeling that binds man to his creator. And uh, he says also in another book, The Consoler, that uh, it, the religion's exteriorizations are always love in the most sublime expressions. And then if you go to Leon Denis in Christianity and Spiritism, he says that uh, for Jesus in one word, all religion, and he say also all philosophy, Consists, consists of love. Then we go. We must go to Kardec in the Spiritist magazine, December 1868. There he gave, gave us his concept of religion. He says that religion for him is a bond that unites men. And the fact of such a bond is uh, to establish fraternity and solidarity. Well, the foundation of such ideas, fraternity and solidarity, is love, right? So, in that sense, uh, and he, he, he himself asked, uh, if that is so, is the spirit in a religion? And he, he answered, yes, it is a religion, although he says that it is a religion in a philosophical sense. But that we can discuss a little more, bit more about that later. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And finally, Tanya. Really interesting to hear everybody has different perspectives. And that's one of the things I like about Spiritism is, as we say in English, it's a broad church. Um, and so for me, the, the approach, the door through which I come into contact with the, the ideas of Spiritism in the literature is the philosophical and the scientific um, I think it's a spiritual philosophy for me. Uh, I think our spirit, our scientific understanding is still quite limited. And so as we discover more about life, the universe, um, other dimensions, energies, um, that uh, the gap that uh, exists between religion and science will, uh, will continue to close. Um, and you know, interesting to note and shows more, more about my ignorance is that many years ago um, I discovered that 
you know, natural philosophy and moral philosophy effectively sort of started out at the same route and branched off in quite different directions. One became science and the other you know, moral philosophy as we know it. And uh, for me, spiritism starts to bring those um, back in, uh, in together. And so the sort of the, the ethical dimension of spiritism, this focus on a philosophy of living a good life, a life of um, developing good qualities and uh, doing good to oneself and to others um, has scientific implications. And we can talk about that later that, you know, the within psychology and neuroscience, there's, there's a growing body of research showing effectively teachings embodied in the various different religions about the golden rule, do unto others. Um, actually has real implications for mental and physical health. So de facto, it was sort of, I won't say buried within religion, but it was, the story was told or the ideas were shared through religions because the science didn't exist at that stage to be able to um, to present in the way that science is beginning to. Great. Thank you, Tanya. So no, obviously we know that... Uh... It's not always easy to give uh, a quick and concise answer to that question, is spiritism religion, and to try to give some kind of justification as to why we think that way. So let's go to the next question. So, and I think we'll, we'll start with uh, Umbatu for this question. How can we define what a religion is? And is there a difference between a philosophy that is religious and a religion that is philosophical? Well, <laughs> we, we, we may we, need we, more time today time for, this, <laughs> for this episode. <laughs> well, um, it, it, it is certainly a polysemic word. So it, it, it is uh, uh, recognized as a, a word that has several meanings, several possible meanings, some of them uh, contradictory to each other. So uh, we, we have to be very careful in defining religion and it's relevant to define religion and, and to, to say what we understand uh, by it, because uh, in, in expressing ourselves, we at least let people know what we are talking about, since it, it is a tricky word and, and very polysemic. So uh, from one perspective, we could uh, attach or, or link religion, the word religion, with the religious experience, which is uh, more or less uh, what uh, Roberto Atanabe called the essential part of religion. Uh, if we connect religion with the religious experience, it could be uh, extremely uh, broad, uh, including many forms of animism, paganism, and uh, spiritual experiences that people have in a very individual sense and uh, uh, not in connection with a society, institution, or uh, even uh, uh, when people cannot formalize uh, for themselves in their own thoughts uh, what this experience means. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a more formal definition, uh, which is connected to institution, creed, doctrine, um, possibly uh, to, to uh, priests and, and to a class of, of priests, then uh, religion is certainly something that uh, can be defined very, very precisely in terms of the, the cultural and, and material expression, uh, such as uh, many Christian denominations, not Christianity, but... Uh, the, the Mormon Church, the, the Baptist Church, the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church, and so on and so on. Uh, from a, a, a more essentialist perspective, when we think uh, about the religious experience, uh, these definitions, uh, they, they necessarily uh, are more blurred and we have to think in more general terms, mm -hmm. such as Christianity, or even uh, religious experience uh, in general, uh, uh, and, and uh, disregarding the, the cultural or institutional background of 
does uh, having these experiences. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I was going to sort of go on with a follow up sub part to this. And maybe we'll go to Roberto first with this. So, is there a difference between being religious and being a religion, being scientific and being a science, and being philosophical and being a philosophy? Being religious and being religious. Yes. Well, um, I don't think that, that, that there is much difference. Uh, other, I, we can uh, well, we can work on such a concept of a phil philosophy, philo philo philosophical, but all, all have the same root, right? So. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that religious is different from religion or science or scientific or philosoph uh, philosophical to, from philosophy. They are all, they, they have the same roots. What we can, we can uh, have uh, differences between these, these three words, right? Religion, science, and philosophy. Uh, they are uh, different things. Uh, when you ask, for example, to Umberto about the uh, Philosophy that is religion. We, we, we can have some philosophy that has some religi religious aspects, like the medieval philosophers, right? Like St. Saint, Saint Augustine, St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, Origin, and so on, and so forth. But uh, uh, they, are, they, they, can, they, they can have some relationship, but they are different concepts, totally different. Science and uh, philosophies, uh, is, is, is linked to the idea of uh, faith and uh, uh, for reason. And the religion is linked to the idea of the faith, which is a different thing, right? But then uh, science and philosophy, they are based on reason, but on different aspects. Science looks to the, let's say, to the material world, right? In philosophy, uh, in, in two specific things, uh, science is the physical study, the movement, let's say, biology uh, studies life. In philosophy, uh, it doesn't have a, spe a specific uh, subject. Philosophy looks to the whole. So using reason, but for, for different uh, objects. So that I, I could, I could, uh, I, can, I can think about the answer for your question. Okay. So we'll go now to Andrea. Do you think that, um, one reason why we're having debates like this and why there may be some sort of disagreements within spiritism and is because there's a different point of view of the understanding of terminology, especially of words like religion. Yeah, I'm, I'm really loving uh, this panel and listening to everyone. Um, as Tanya had mentioned, it's really great to, to hear the different point of views. And this is actually something that comes up quite often, right? Uh, the difference between religion, religiousness, it's uh, this, which, by the way, the scientific aspect of spiritism is really what drew me in the beginning. And then for some reason, I started going more towards the religious. Um, and then I started considering why, why did that happen? What was it that shifted in me? And of course, it goes back to what Roberto and, and uh, Umberto talked about this aspect of what does it mean this religiousness something that connects us to the creator different from religions because you may have a religion you may profess it but there is really no connection you might even do so in order to um you know keep up with your culture or do what you think is demanded of you but there is really no basic understanding of the message behind what you are following there is nothing that is guiding you towards having this experience that is religious. And I also would like to say that I do believe that um, not only in this present experience, many people have had a negative uh, experience with religion, be it because they were used, be it because they were um, there were falsified teachings behind it, maybe there were ambitious people demands on it, and also because of our own immortality. The experiences that we have had in previous lives in which brought a lot of pain. You know, if we read the book, Joanna and Jesus, um, a, a, a love story, it is a book that yes, yet is not translated by Cesar Said, in which he, he talks a little bit about uh, Uncle Newsom. 
And Uncle Nilsson is the faithful friend for Valdo Branco. I don't know if you guys know about him. He's the one who founded the mansion of the way in Brazil with Divaldo Franco, that Canadian. And um, in the beginning, when he met Divaldo, he had a really hard time connecting with Jesus. It was just something that, and here's his best friend proclaiming this religious aspect of spiritism, talking about God, talking about faithfulness to the spiritist dissemination, talking about Jesus as being that friend. And he just had this hesitation. There was something that did not allow him to even want to hear the stories. But Devaldo persisted and he persisted until one day Nilsson said, Devaldo, it's enough. You don't need to try to make up my mind anymore. Something connected, something makes sense. And there was a shift in idea. And so he learned that when he was um, in the time of Christ, he was the one, he was the, the child of Joanna of Cusa, who was burned alive at the stake. And the, the people that were actually condemning them would say, you know, negate, uh, I'm not sure what the word of abjura is, maybe my aunt, my aunt to deny Christ. Yeah. And Joanna de Angelis, who was Joanna of Cusa at that time, was tied at the stake with her child, and she wouldn't. I mean, this is how, this is how deep her religiousness with Christ was. And she wouldn't do it. Imagine us, if we had a child at the stake and the child is saying, mom, please just do it. I don't want to die. But she didn't. And so he brought with him in the memories in his archive, spiritually speaking, that pain. And it was really hard for him to have that type of connection. But I just wanted to say something here because I did prepare a little bit on the material that Alain Kardec in the Spiritist Magazine or Spiritist Review, however you want to say it, in the uh, 1858, those books are available in PDF for those who seek it in case you can't buy it or in a country where you don't have access to actually buy the paperback. He does state that once Spiritism is well understood, is what he's saying, it, it is the protection of truly religious ideas that are gonna fade away. The contributing to the betterment of individual is going to bring the betterment of the masses. Once spiritism is well understood and that the time is not very far when human beings as a whole collectively will understand that in this body of knowledge, which by the way, I don't like the word doctrine, I like the word body of knowledge, they will find the most fecund elements of order, well-being and prosperity for all people. So. He talks about the need to understand spiritism, spiritism, which comes and kills materialism and in turn feeds and develops that, that feeds and develops egotism and selfishness is explained by Alain Kardec as that um, manifestation of this body of knowledge that is going to bring us human beings a reason for our existence. And that's the philosophical part of it. But then he talks about once it's well understood, there will become a society where all human beings are driven by the love for their fellow human beings, regardless of the religion that they profess, if they understood what spiritism has to offer. So they talk about the aspect of charity written at the top of all codes. And of course, he brings the golden rule, which is understood by all religions, do unto others as you'd wish them to do unto you. And I think that once we start thinking about religiousness as that I have uh, somebody in our study group who doesn't believe in anything whatsoever, God, life after life, nothing. But he does believe in being good. And whether that has a reward for him or not, it doesn't matter. Because this is actually one of the questions that is addressed in the Spirits book. Alain Kardec answers a question, asks a question about people that actually do say that they have a religion. Um, they say, is it wrong to practice a religion that is not believed it from the bottom of our hearts? If it's done just simply out of respect for our parents or whatever the case might be, or to not offend those who think differently. And the spirits answer, as in so many other things, intent is everything. The, the idea is to show respect for the beliefs of others perfectly. You don't do anything wrong perfectly, but in fact, they actually do better than those who ridicule the beliefs of others, which shows a lack of charity. So those who practice religion out of ulterior motives or movement or ambition 
they're actually not doing anything for themselves or for their human kind. So I don't know if that answer that confused, but I, uh, I think that a lot of the confusion that comes has to do with the experiences, how we grew up, what we were exposed to in this life and a previous existence as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that's very, very good comments there. So I'm going to go to the next question because I think we can already move on to another question. And we're going to start with Tanya for this one. So within the books of Kardec, Let's just bring everyone on screen because it's a bit of a long question. Uh, within the books of Kardec and even, even many psychographed messages, public talks and live events even nowadays, there's lots of mention regarding God, Jesus, spirits being spiritists being Christian, mediumship with Jesus, etc. Do you think that this limits spiritism to being only open and valid for Christians? Or is it truly open to anyone from any religious background? And how about those who are not of a religious background, but who could be open to the philosophical and the scientific side of it? Um, I think this is where it, it is something I actually do feel quite strongly about, is that I think there is indeed, as Andrea said, this body of knowledge that can be incredibly enlightening to help us to understand life in a, in a greater sense and uh, has many broad implications beyond, you know, the immediate obvious one is that life continues beyond the death of the physical body and how huge that is for somebody going through a bereavement. And if they don't relate from a religious perspective, wouldn't it be a shame to not allow this to be, um, how can I put it, uh to pull back the lens so that it can be also looked at from a, very much from the philosophical and the uh the scientific perspective and uh, i got very excited when i saw the book that umberto and others have have recently published on um the science of uh, life after death um to to see how the evidence base is building that will reach others who really need that comfort uh, in in Europe because I think you know we're, we're representing three different continents here and in Europe it's a very very broad church um, recently I was looking at an EU survey that goes out every couple of years and it shows the incredible diversity of beliefs and values there is a broad value system across the the European uh, continent but let's say from one extreme to the other, you would see in Poland, 95% of people consider themselves to have a religious belief. In the UK, it's 40. So you have 60% of people in the UK who do not have a religious belief. And so presenting things from the scientific and the philosophical um, is going to mean that we can, uh, that people can be reached and people can connect with these ideas uh, in a way that, that could be not just comforting, but truly life-changing. Um, and I think there's a considerable amount of information around things like mediumship that demystifies mediumship, that sort of sees it as, you know, it's purely, um, it's it's a, a mechanical process, like as Andre Luis's book is me uh, Mechanics of Mediumship, I think it's been translated into English describes in, in a lot of detail around sort of the physics um, behind uh, what drives mediumship, which demystifies it and shows it as a very natural phenomenon, um, which which is not metaphysical, but it is, is something that, um, that science is uh, in the very, very early stages of, of learning about. Um, and interesting that in, in each of the major major countries that there are, there is research going on, albeit behind the scenes, apparently. Um, so I think certainly for me, I think it's important therefore to broaden the language that, that is used so that uh, spiritism and the, the insights that can be gained from it are accessible to those of a non-religious uh, background um, and even those of an atheistic background, as um, Andrea spoke of. 
Yeah, thank you. And so I was going to go to Anne now and get your thoughts on this. You know, should spiritism be open to everyone? Is it open to everyone? Is it only open to Christians? Could there be a Hindu spiritist, a Jewish, Jewish spiritist, a Muslim spiritist, an atheist spiritist? <laughs> yes, um, and one of the things that uh, I love when I, whenever I study the, the spirits book is quite early on, um, they say several times, they say, the spirits say, we're not bothered how you call things as long as you're agreed about what you're talking about. And I think the issue around words and definitions and labels is an area where we where we struggle lots of times. And so always defining things is useful, but once you define it, you limit it, and then you move on. In in the which book is it? so yeah, it was I, the, I was reading earlier in the Gospel according to Spiritism. It says Spiritism has come to shine a light on all humanity. It is inclusive. It's not exclusive. You don't have to be a member of the club. You don't have to have an ID. You don't have to profess certain things. Everybody is welcome. And uh, I take an example uh, of a, a lady who came to our group during a period of time. And uh, she was from an Eastern European country and she was very staunch Catholic, but she was having events of mediumship in her workplace and happened to be that there was a Brazilian uh, person that worked there said, oh, you need to go to Spiritist Center, you see. She said, I keep seeing people who are not there. Anyway, so she came and we studied for a year and uh, obviously she has her mediumship. And then she went back to her country in Eastern Europe. And she said, it's been so liberating to read this, to understand this and study this. And she studies it now on her own. But she carries on being a staunch Catholic and going to mass every week. And that's a very important part of her community, her family, her culture. But she said, when I go to Mass now, so the priest is down there, blah, 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 saying, and she says, and I'm connecting to God direct. And I let the priest say what he needs to say. But she said, I have a religious experience when I go now because I pray in a meaningful way. I understood prayer in a completely different way. And I connect directly with God. And she said, and my life is full. And I don't need the church, but the church is part of my community and my people. And so I, I, I carry on with it. Uh, and it's... You know, I don't want to, to leave them because I don't want to leave my community. But it says it has transformed how I, I experience the mass, which before was, uh, I didn't really connect to. But now after studying spiritism, she says, I do, I do my own prayers and I connect in a completely different way. And I see light coming in and I see spirits walking through the church. And it's absolutely fine. And she is like the kindest, most you know, benevolent person ever. And she goes on, she does all her charity and everything. And that for me was a big example because uh, some people, they'll come through spiritism, they'll pick up what they need at that time and carry on their journey. It's like they're, they're passing by. It's such a wide body of knowledge. And like Tanya was saying, I get this a lot. And I think this connects to something that Andrea was saying as well. Some people, they might be coming from a troubled past for whatever reasons, in past lives and, or just the history of religion in Europe and things. And they need to come and start from something that they can accept, which is perhaps science or philosophy. And once all that starts making sense and you can feel comfortable in that, then you might be able to start making different connections. I think it's a step at a time. It's, you can't just take it all in at once. I know some people come already with that religious fervor, fervor and they just really connect to the religious side and they really feel it strong, but then they struggle thinking about the scientific side and they, they don't want proof or, or evidence or investigations, which is also not helpful because we need to be that holistic being and have that understanding. So I think everybody, any person can study spiritism and take something from it. And uh, it, you say they might take it back into their own religion, into the way they practice their religion, or they might be that they decide then um, that they want to carry on and study spiritism more in depth. It's, um, I, I, feel, I feel very strongly that it's open to everybody, everybody's welcomed. And I do worry sometimes if people uh, use a Christian terminology very strongly, that that might exclude people, they might feel mm -hmm. not welcome because, oh, I'm not Christian, and they keep talking about So whenever we refer to Jesus and we say, 
Jesus has been given as our model and our guide, our brother. So it's not this God and, you know, these images from the church. You have to continue be deconstructing those ideas to say, even, uh, and I present, I say, you know, like Gandhi would say, the greatest teachings came from Jesus. He said, you know, the day the Christians behave as Jesus said, I will become a Christian too. <laughs> You know what I mean? So say it, everybody agrees that the teachings of, priest, uh, or of Jesus are great, but what the churches have done with it have really muddied the waters for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to take people in um, baby steps wherever we yeah. are and accept that this is the point where you're coming in and what, what, you know, what good can you get from it? What part of the light is enough? If you get too much light in one go, you're blinded. So you need to have that uh, gentle approach and what is meaningful for you at this time in your life. I think something like that. I think Andrea wants to bring in some, uh, some of her thoughts on this as well. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And uh, Anne, really great. Kardec stated uh, one time that there are, a, uh, there are Christians in large numbers, right? But the true Christians are rare. And we're not talking about the aspect of religion. We're talking about those that do follow uh, Christ as model and guide as the benevolent spirits presented for us. But I just want to, I, I know that we're supposed to bring maybe just our personal opinion, but I couldn't help it because, and I know this might be a little bit po polemic, Adam, but I'm going to go for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, because we need to bring Kardec back. And, and, and I go back to the Spirits Review because I have fallen in love with uh, all of the collection all over again because there is so many great stuff in there that it's worth uh, our reading. But there is a letter from a Catholic about Spiritism, um, and it was actually in 1860. And there is this gentleman by uh, the name of Dr. Grand, uh, who was a former vice consul of France, and he brought um, a brochure that proposed it to demonstrate that it's possible to be simultaneously a good Catholic and a zealous spiritist. And he says, in that sense, he's preaching the word and by the example, since he's sincerely one and the other. And he says, through the facts, through the arguments of rare, rigorous logic, so no longer blind faith, he establishes the agreement between spiritism and religion demonstrating that all of the fundamental dogmas found in spiritism give an explanation that satisfied even the most demanding reason, which asked, you know, talks to the philosophical part of it. And he says that theology has not yet successfully been able to provide, concluding that if the dogmas were taught in the way they would find less incredulity, and hence religion would have to gain from an alliance for casting that one day and here's the polemic part, Adam. Spiritism will be in religion and religion and spiritism. Make sense? It makes some sense, but let's go and see what Umberto thinks about that, because I think he's maybe have, having a few thoughts as well. Umberto. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, uh, the essential was, was said, but uh, I would only like to, to add uh, a small curiosity. Uh, because I recently knew that uh, in, in the Brazilian uh, Jewish community, uh, there are uh, many uh, Jew uh, spirits, uh, in, including rabbis. And I think this is utterly interesting because uh, we, we see it uh, in, in practice, people have um, a, a sense of uh, belonging to different uh, traditions and they do not feel the conflict in that well that may be very brazilian that's true <laughs> this is a very democratic people and uh, for uh, some uh, orthodox churches even uh, too syncretic <laughs> or, or too open to to the idea of belonging to two or three different traditions but uh, I think uh, spiritism is especially uh, apt to that because uh, it, it is uh, in, in all formal aspects, not a religion. So it, 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 it's a powerful boost to religiosity or to spirituality in a, a more essential sense, but uh, it is not a formally demanding you do not need to do anything 
in order to be a, a spiritist. You don't need to believe in anything. Uh, in fact, uh, you can question everything and there is no single principle or dogma that you cannot question on, on, on the opposite. You, you should question everything. And in this sense, it is pretty philosophical and, and very, um, uh, uh, it, it doesn't demand really anything uh, compared to, to what religions actually do demand from, from their believers. So uh, I, I think this, this feature makes uh, spiritism ve very um, adequate to uh, connect to other beliefs uh, in a harmonious way. Great. Sorry. What you said is so good that it, you know, sort of uh, making me want to jump to jump across a couple of questions. But actually, I want to stick with you, Umberto, with the next question that we had on the list is, do you think that spiritists would accept if there were books such as the Torah, according to spiritism, the Quran, according to spiritism, the sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, according to spiritism? Me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I really think it would be great, and I'm eager to see that coming, you know. <laughs> I, I do expect to see uh, similar books with similar titles uh, in the near future, uh, because uh, the, the gospel, uh, according to spiritism, uh, already shows that uh, Spiritism has a philosophical approach to the gospel because uh, in, in a religious dogmatics it would be absurd to read the gospel under a, a foreign light. It, it would be near to, to heresy or blasphemy to read the gospel under a, another light or a foreign light. And when Kardec does that when he did that, he uh, pretty much showed us that uh, he was not very concerned with an essential truth in the Gospels, but he was committed with the rational analysis of that sacred book. And we can pretty much uh, include any other sacred uh, scripture uh, in, in the list. Oh, oh, oh. Well. And Roberto, what about yourself? Would you be open to accepting those kinds of books? Well, actually, uh, Ada, I, uh, Herculano Pires uh, tells us that uh, spiritism is based on all the philosophical and religious tradition. You mentioned, for example, the Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talked about the reincarnation. Right, so it's there it's thousands of years before Christ, the idea of a reincarnation, and it's here you know, on the on the spiritist book. Uh, regarding, for example, uh, Judaism and, and the Islamic religion, uh, Christ, Christianism and the Islamic religion has their roots in, in, in Judaism, so there is some connection here, right? So uh, I think that you, you cannot have a, a, a spiritist Quran, as, as you said, right? There are different things, but they are in some way uh, connected because uh, the truth is eternal, is everywhere and anytime. So what you, ca what, what, what you have is, in Kardec says that in, in the spiritist book, all the religions lost from the past has this truth. But uh, according to the timing, you have some 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 mixed things there, right? So, as we evolve as 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 spirits, we are getting close to 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 the truth. So, uh, in this in this sense, they are all connected. When when you think of, for example, about uh, all these um, Buddha, for example, all these these uh, former uh, religions. Uh, guides let's say who who sent who sent them to to the earth was well, jesus was was who, who sent them right because he's the, we say he's is the 
plan, uh, the planet uh, government. So we have uh, they they are all in interconnected. But when we talked about the spirit as a religion, then uh, I have no doubt is is a Christian religion because you 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 see that in the first chapter of the gospel, right? The gospel according to spiritism. Spiritism is the third revelation after Moses and Jesus. So it's a Christian uh, religion. And that makes a difference uh, regarding the other religion. That's why you, you can't have, a, regarding your former question, you can't have a, a spiritist uh, uh, Buddhism, for example. But you have, uh, you have common concepts on, on both religions, right? So uh, that, that's a, a, what I would like to, to, uh, to, to, to answer about this. If we go to the posthumous work, for example, Adam, there is a, in the second part, there is a text there about the imitation of a gospel. Who is the gospel, the, the former previous name of the gospel according to the spiritism? And there the, the spiritist says to Kardec, uh, the time is approaching when you should proclaim spiritism as the only true, truly Christian tradition. So. No doubt is a Christian is a Christian religion, right? But that doesn't mean that it, it has a universal uh, uh, aspect, as as all the other religions have. The problem is, is what we as human do with our religions. We we we, we change the, the 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 foundation of, of it, such a religion. When Anne said, for example, uh, she uh, sh she thinks that the spiritism is not a religion when we think it, uh, about the religion which make divisions, right? But that's not the religion of Christ anymore. And that's what we have today. So humans, we humans deviate from, from, the, from the basic principles, but then we don't have the religion anymore. Right? So uh, that, that's what I think about this. <laughs> So looking at the faces of some of the other panelists, I think a few other people may want to give their opinions to that. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question because this is something that a lot of people have asked. And uh, they also ask about a fourth revelation, right? Isn't there a fourth revelation? And we kind of like miss the, the boat or the bus or something and we are not really uh, aware of it. So I, I like what Roberto brought us because the gospel according to spiritism right in the beginning, Alain Kardec does bring the objective of the work in establishing that the subjects that are contained in the Gospels can be divided into five parts. It talks about the ordinary events in the life of Jesus, the miracles and the prophecies, the words that served to establish the dogmas of the church, and then the moral teachings. And he will say, oh, here I'm in my hair stuff. <laughs> Although the first four have been the object of controversy, the last one, which has to do with the moral teachings, remain unassailable. And so he says, everyone admires gospel morality, right? It's true. Everyone proclaims its sublimity and the necessity, but many do so based on what they have heard instead. So he says that the object, the objective of the work, the gospel, according to spiritism, is to be for everyone's use regardless. He's going to say we all may find any the means to, to conform our conduct to the morals of Jesus Christ. Moreover, spiritists will find the applications that concern them specifically. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there because it reminded me, and it's actually my husband's favorite part of the gospel according to spiritism, when explaining what is the objective of the gospel according to spiritism. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Great. Uh, Tanya, what are your thoughts? I'd go the other way, and I would say, what about a book that focused on the essence of the teachings, the, the ethical values, the ethical teachings, the psychology that's embedded across the different traditions that is shone a light on in the gospel according to spiritism and sort of move it beyond the religious into a um, uh, purely a focus on uh, using a context that's more universal and that uses language that is more universal and more accessible to those who don't profess a particular religion. And so, um, to me, that would be, you know, I guess that's kind of the perennial philosophy. Um, but to sort of, to, to uh, 
yeah, to, to move out of the, uh, um, again, for me, it's, it's about sort of making the essence of it more, um, uh, unwrapping it from the, the historical and shining a light on it from the, the psychological, like, you know, the, um, forgiveness, for example, as a concept, you know, in, in the, in the religious sense, you know, it's Jesus saying, I'd tell you not to forgive seven times, but 70 times seven. And there's a couple of other references, you know, don't come and pray unless you've forgiven, unless you've emptied your heart before you connect. And now we have scientific studies that are showing the benefits of forgiveness and that um, those who forgive enjoy significantly better physical and mental health, that it it improves mood, um, it improves quality of relationships, it reduces blood pressure, improves cardiovascular health, it improves the immune system. Um, so effectively, the feedback mechanism, the feedback loop in, uh, in the body and in science is showing us, you know, guess what? He was right. But they weren't, they didn't take, they didn't have a blood pressure monitor back in those days. So he just told the story, forgive. Don't ask me why, but forgive <laughs> it, you know, and then gradually we're sort of catching up with. So effectively it was like an early um, psychology slash uh, implications for physiology, as well as going far beyond the physical into the spiritual health as well, that transcends the physical body and, and will then, go into, you know, lightening the, the, the spirit body, the astral body, so that the, the spirit can ascend across across dimensions. So to me, I think that that is the book I would love to, to see written. And I'd look for, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, what about for yourself, Anne? Yeah, no, I, uh, I was thinking something, when, when, uh, my example's always quite sort of like, uh, linked to common life, but sort of less uh, erudite. But you know, it's like for for centuries we've been told you must do this, you must do that. Just like a small child, the parents say you must do this or you must not touch the electricity. The child doesn't understand if they put their fingers there, they'll be electrocuted. So they're just told you must do this or you must not do that. So as humanity, we come out of our infancy where we've been told. And we've rebelled as teenagers now we don't want to be told we want to do our own thing but then somebody you start saying well look there is a reason why we've told you this and this is the reason and science starts to bring it and the explanations start to come and then you can say oh you know that which i rebelled against i thought because it was impositions actually has a reason to be and i feel myself uh, in that phase of evolution where i'm you know i'm stopping from the rebelling and going like oh actually they might have had a point but telling me oh you must forgive somebody who has hurt me just, just like say well imposing it on me say you must forgive them i haven't forgiven them i'm angry i'm upset with them why should i forgive them i need that explanation why should i forgive them i need to understand how the energies work that we all make mistakes that tomorrow it might be me who does that you know and all the, I need to um, sort of break out from that imposition and I need to understand that's I'm talking about myself or where I am and spiritism explains to me so that I can accept those moral rules moral rules uh, because I can understand them now and in the same way when it talks about reincarnation and plus the books from Andrea Luisa explaining you know the process of reincarnation I'm absolutely fascinated by that and a hundred percent I get it I say well maybe in my lifetime still you know science will get there and you will study reincarnation at uh, medical university you know medical school and not in in spiritist books because a lot of things that are you know in the spiritist books uh, they're talking about something that's coming in terms of science in the future i always joke about you know how science uh, technology evolved during my lifetime and uh, maybe i don't know me or roberto we are the older ones here but in the beginning, when Divaldo used to come 30 years ago, we used to write letters. Yeah, write the letter with pen and paper in the post, two, three weeks after by year. And sometimes it got there, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes the reply came, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes we'd go to the airport with no clue if he was actually going to be on the plane or not, because we didn't know if any letter had been lost. 
And when they invented the fax machine, the fax machine was miraculous. You put the letter and boom, it's arrived on the other side of the world instantaneously. It, it was like, what, what, how bigger can we go than this? Here we are all having a chat across the continents as if nothing. And this has been in, in my lifespan. So I believe that things are uh, even that the science will bring in lots of things that are in the world of uh, revelation into the world of uh, actual scientific explanation as we go gathering the tools to ena enable us to explain things and doing the research and the evidence. And I think that with that, all the shift will go because then when it's, when it's evident, for example, that reincarnation is not uh, a religious belief or a philosophical basis, but it's actually a scientific reality, how will that impact people's lives? So in a way, I think with spiritism, we're just going a little bit ahead as in all religions, they were always trying to push us ahead. And when you think about when here, I can't remember which year it was, when they, for the first time, they allowed the Bible in English, because the Bible was in Latin. Nobody spoke Latin except the priests. So nobody could read the Bible for themselves and actually see, what, well, actually, is that's what's written there or not. And when they put the Bible in English for the first time, it was, a, it was an explosion of, I can read the Bible myself and actually hear those words and give the intonation I want to. And I think spiritual, it comes in that same way, it brings a light, it moves, shifts us on a little bit, but there's a lot to come. And I say all our spiritual growth and development, it's universal, everybody will benefit from it. Um, so I'm just thinking that the divisions we have around the world, they are historical. And we have, and they have served their purpose, and they're still serving their purpose. But as we grow and develop, as as spirits who are incarnate and humanity progresses, those bridges go falling. But we might still want to have our own colorings and our own flavors of the regions where we live. And each one, you know, we're bringing different things. I always call it we're bringing different things to the banquet. We all bring in our dish, which is slightly different, but we need all the dishes to make the banquet. That's how I feel that we need. Um, to come together and to listen to one another uh, and uh, not prejudge. Um, I think, you know, Kardec, because of the way he was uh, educated with Pestalozzi, with uh, that bringing together both religions, coming from a history of so many religious wars in Europe, I mean, he had the ambition to bring, you know, Catholics and Protestants together. Uh, and that was sort of uh, nurtured while he was in Switzerland, wasn't it? So a lot of the things, uh, you feel that that's the flavor of the times in which he le lived as well, that he's trying to, to give an opportunity that people uh, can, can actually find a common ground further ahead, step by step. Sorry, I spoke too much. <laughs> that's okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, we're going to give all of our guests a little bit of a break for a moment and uh, we're going to just go over a couple of announcements from us here at Kardec Group. So let me bring on, there we go, that's the one. No, we want it there like that. So we wanted to talk about a couple of fundraising campaigns that we have here. Um, that one's better. Um, just that our guests can have a chance to have a glass of water or a cup of tea. Uh, so we want to talk about two of the uh, fundraising campaigns that we have here at Cardet Group. Uh, the first one is the Joanne and Giangelis Translation Project, which is a campaign in partnership with uh, AMI Brazil, Manson da Caminho, um, Centro Espírita Caminho da Redenção, and uh, Editora Liao. And the purpose of this campaign is to help help us get uh, professional translations of the entire psychological series from the spirit Jean Giangelis, which were received through the Brazilian medium Givaldo Franco. And all donations will be very welcome for this. Uh, the, the books will then serve as a basis of translations for all other languages as well. Obviously, it's going from Portuguese into English, then from English to all the other languages that is being planned. And so all donations will be very welcome. You can make a one-off payment, uh, automatic monthly donation, and 100% of the funds given to this campaign will support this project. And 
all the proceeds of the sales of the final books will go to support Mansan de Camus. So again, that is a campaign from in partnership with Mansan de Camus, AMI Brazil, the Brazilian Medical Asso Association, and um, medical, sorry, Brazilian Medical Spiritist Association, uh, Centro Espírito Camino da Head and Song, which is the Spiritist Center at uh, Manson da Camino, and Editorial Liao, who are the ones who publish the books. The other fundraising campaign that we have is the High Five campaign, uh, where we are trying to help two very worthwhile groups in Brazil, uh, Instituto Multi Iron in Curitiba and Grupo Espírito Sheila in Salvador. And both of these work to help their local poor communities with everything from educational support, vocational support for children, at, at, for adults and children, after school activities, medical support, housing, food, and a lot more. 100% um, of the donations given to this will be split 50-50 between both groups. Um, and you know, they, they need support. They need support, it's as simple as that. You know, we, we know that people going through different kinds of issues with energy crisis, food crisis in many countries, but these, these, these guys are helping people from very poor communities. So anything that you can help, again, all donations are welcome, whether it's a one-off, whether it's a monthly, whatever. Yeah. So, and of course, here at Cardec Group, we also need your support. You no, know, we we are a we're a group, we're a charity. We have our our events that also need supporting face to face meetings for two spiritist groups. Like I said at the start, we run two groups: the Spiritist Society of Windsor and Maidenhead, and the Spiritist Society of Bista. We have a library. We have various other activities as well, and. You no, know, look, you can find out all about all both these campaigns and how to support us going to www.cardec.org.uk slash donations. Um, we just lost Roberto. No, here he is. He's back with us now. So again, if you want to know, know about either of these campaigns or how to support Cardec Group or anything about Cardec Group, just go to our website, www.cardec.org.uk and for these fundraising campaigns forward slash donations right so we've still got a few more minutes so we'll have a couple more questions um let me just check which question we're going to go to i think we will go with let's go to umberto for this next question so people state that spiritism is a religion because it talks about morality isn't it possible to talk about morality from a non-religious perspective? Well, another extremely profound question, Adam. Um, well, um, I would briefly say yes and no. <laughs> it, it, it is possible to develop a moral philosophy without any connection with the major religious ideas, such as the idea of God uh, or immortality of the soul and uh, the consequential uh, idea of uh, reward and, and punishment, for example. Um, but these moral philosophies, they do lack something. They are not quite complete without uh, addressing this uh, ultimate questions, which are regarded as uh, religious uh, questions or religious subjects. Well, um, on the other hand, uh, we, we should question if uh, the religious aspect of, of these subjects uh, is really necessary or if it's uh, only a cultural bias that makes us read the concept of God, for example, as uh, a necessarily religious concept, because uh, if it is not so, then we could build and structure an entire philosophy that we could uh, consider uh, deprived from, from religious uh, aspects, and that would uh, 
be a complete moral philosophy. Um, one possible candidate, for example, is uh, Plato's philosophy or Aristotle's philosophy. They both are purely philosophers. Uh, it would be exaggerated to say they are religious people in any sense. Maybe Plato a little bit more than, than Aristotle, but not so much. And at the same time, they, uh, they have consistent answers for uh, the question of, of God or the ultimate reality, which uh, they consider uh, rational, intelligent, uh, um, omnipresent, uh, the source of being, and so and so and so. It is not, uh, it's not nature in any sense uh, similar to, to materialism, for example. Uh, but again, <laughs> uh, if we are to agree with each other and to, to achieve some consensus, we have to come back to the meaning of the words. And if we want to, to mean by religion something uh, more essential, then uh, it would be uh, uh, admissible or uh, acceptable to, to consider Plato or Aristotle religious. Uh, man, for example, uh, I myself like this this perspective. The idea that they, uh, in some sense, they, they were religious people, or they they included religiosity in their philosophy, or they developed a, a religious philosophy. Uh, but we are just coining new terminology, new names for what we cannot express clearly in the normal cultural context. Because uh, if we meet people on the street, or if we are talking to uh, a priest even, uh, it is very possible that they will strongly deny that uh, Aristotle is a religious person, for example. <laughs> so um, we have to, to make decisions based on terminology that uh, we are consciously inventing and, and producing for uh, the specific purposes that we have in mind. Uh, and that's a, 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 an exciting thing. That's, that's not a problem, in my opinion. Uh, it, it makes more evident that the role of philosophy is very strong in our uh, future definitions of religion if we are to move to more global and inclusive uh, notions of, of religion, as well as the role of science is also very important. Uh, Tanya kindly uh, mentioned uh, our new book uh, published just a couple months ago on the science of life after death. And uh, we we did not obviously gather all <laughs> scientific evidence, but we did gather a uh, show numerous and, and very, very strong evidence that suggests the survival of the soul, or the personality of consciousness after bodily death. And uh, this uh, approach uh, ignores any religious commitment that the, the readers may have so it, it is pretty irrelevant for the sake of the quality of the argument or, uh, or, or the evidence uh, if one has a religion or not. Thank you. Lots to think about there. I was, not all of us have read, read all the philosophers, but um, any other panelists wants to bring their thoughts to this question? Morality from a non-religious perspective? Andrea. I do. Um, well, because of the work that we do um, with Divaldo, you know, there are so many examples that he brings. And I remember that he stated that he would rather see an atheist who does good things than a religious person who is a hypocrite and is empty um, of any type of good actions, charity, benevolence, indulgence, and what have you. But it's quite I mean, my view, it, it would be very hard, right? to live such a life without really taking into consideration 
our immortality, right? And Anne brought this very beautifully. I talked about understanding a little bit the repercussions that, that we have once we understand the aspect of reincarnation. So when somebody does state that they're an atheist and they're doing good things, they're not religious. They're, they're putting in practice what we would call morality. Um, and we also can't forget the fact that although we're talking about this and there's a, a panel about different opinions and, and what have you, we also need to remember as spiritists that we are being guided by our, uh, we can call it mentor, spirit guide, uh, guardian angel, whatever we're going to call it. But we do receive those certain guidances so that we don't waste the opportunity of reincarnation. And of course, this has an implication on our future life, on how we are living today. And it's not to impose threat, right? Because Kardec will say that, uh, unfortunately, there are some uh, things that we talk about in spiritism that has almost the same type of Christian teachings that might become threatening when they're pronounced. But spiritism comes filled with consolation and hope on the future life, on the aspect of reward. We are no longer seeing um, the words sin being used, which is very heavy, and I myself don't appreciate it. But to sin is to miss the mark, it's to make a mistake. And how else do we evolve? And how else do we know the difference between right and wrong? How else do we know the difference between good and evil, right? Um, so that's what I wanted to say. I think you are able to live a, live a life uh, ethically without being religious, without having, call it morality, um, but I do believe that without taking into consideration that which we are being taught in spiritism, that we are being guided, that we are being offered opportunities um, for redemption, for spiritual progress, it becomes quite hard to envision life else, you know, in any other way. Thank you, Andrea. Now, Thank we've you. only got time for one more question before we go to, to everyone for their final considerations. So uh, we'll go to the next question and we'll just have two people give their thoughts on this. Um, and I think we'll go to Roberto first for this one. So what can or should Spiritism be doing to help attract those people who get frightened or turned away by, su by words such as God, Jesus, Christian, and whose immediate perception is that Spiritism is a religion when they themselves are not religious but want to study Spiritism? Well, that that's uh, that that's a difficult uh, thing to do, <laughs> Adam. Because uh, uh, when uh, when when I think that uh, spiritism is a religion, <laughs> and I do, then I I can't avoid to talk about uh, talking about in God and and Jesus and, and so on and so forth. And I know that. Uh, in Europe, for example, and I, I think even the in the state, in the United States, many people doesn't like to hear much about the religion. But I think that uh, that happens because um, the religion that they 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 see is not religion in the the essential meaning. Because if we look at the historical overview of the Christianism. We begin with Jesus, with his lessons of love. Then we have the apostolic, apostolic fathers following him, Peter, Paul, and others. Then the Christianism has the freedom of worship with the, the emperor Constantine. Then it became, became the Roman Empire official religion with the, the emperor Theodosius, and then then the problem begins, right? Uh, Christianity involved with the temporal power, richness come, uh, hierarchical structure, altars, vestments, and pagan festivals, which are Christianized. And then begins what uh, Anne already mentioned, the wars, the religion wars, the crusade with the Islam. And then in the 16th century onwards, we have the the, the, the war inside the Christianity, right? Between Catholic and Protestant, and you have the Inquisition. Well, uh, that's the love in this case. 
was left well behind, right? So the, Jesus' message is not there anymore. So the purpose of spiritism is to bring all the, the primitive purity of a Christian again. So that is religion in the, 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 the real meaning, I would say. So what people in general see is not a, a religion, right? So a religion that uh, promotes wars, <laughs> that uh, look to earn money. This is not a religion. This is a false prophets that uh, we see in the gospel court of spirit. Even Jesus talked about that, right? So uh, I, 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 I understand that it's difficult to, to change the mind of all these people. I, I would say only, only time will, will, will resolve that, right? Uh, and in the meantime, I think we, we, we must go with our um, mission, I would say. Uh, and uh, it, it, well, um, divulge the spiritism the, the, the best we can, and then let's time it resolve things, right? People, one, one uh, sooner or later, they, they will come because that is the, 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 the direction, right? Direct the direction. That's what I would like to say about that. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And so finally, we'll go to Tanya with her thoughts regarding this. How can, what or can, what can or should spiritism be doing to attract these kinds of people who get turned away from the religious side of things? You're on mute. I think uh, one of the, the beauties of Spiritism, as I said at the beginning, is that it is a broad church. And so there are many doors through which people can enter. And so different groups will have different approaches, different um, cultures as such, and maybe studying the same books, but through, uh, through a different lens and perhaps picking the books that they study and how they study them and how they discuss them. And so just as that there are, for example, in London, uh, groups that study in Portuguese and some in English, um, there may be some that study more the, the philosophical and the scientific uh, side of things and others that um, uh, focus on, on the religious side. But I think the key thing is that in a European context is to make more of um, the former available so that um that if as i as i mentioned earlier 60 percent of people in the uk don't hold a religious belief and so what for them to to miss out on the opportunity to connect to uh some of the the more scientific and philosophical uh works that kardec and and others brought through like leon denis really kind of focusing on the um I think more on the, the philosophical side and uh, Delan subsequently and on, on more on the, the scientific side um, and some of the, the Andre Luis books, well, two of them really focusing on the, on the, the scientific side that could be uh, quite revelationary for people and certainly help um, potentially to, to comfort those. I, I sort of think, you know, that there's different different layers and levels at which one can engage with spiritism. And the most basic thing is, and I think, you know, I, I think it's at uh, the beginning of the mediums book that um, Kardec speaks about this is, you know, does somebody believe beyond the material? Do, do they believe that life continues? And that sort of, if they don't, then, you know, th 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 where to engage one's times and one's time and effort. And so that that, that sort of very fundamental belief and bringing to bear the the growing evidence base around that that could then open people's mind to something that's so fundamental that could provide so much comfort for when they lose a loved one or when they're approaching the loss of a loved one and how different an experience that could be, or indeed their own mortality if facing illness, and just how how to broaden uh, and make more accessible the the gift 
within the works uh, that we're, we're lucky enough to have access to so that we, we broaden that lens so that we open more doors to, to those who will engage with some things and can choose what they do and do not accept. And again, I think I loved Umberto's um, point earlier about, you know, to question everything, that in that sense, it is a philosophy for me that it's not about indoctrinating anybody to sort of that you have to take the whole lot. It's about that you you need to pass through one's own discriminating, discerning, as discerning as we can make it anyway, mind and decide what we allow in. And that is the beauty of the freedom that we're beginning to, to develop um, so that we can uh, start to learn and grow and choose Um and so for me, sorry, in a roundabout way, I'm just saying I think we need to broaden and make things more accessible so that in keeping the religious narrative, it narrows it in a European context. I'm speaking deliberately in a European context because the US is very different. Brazil is very different. Um, but in European context, it means it's cutting off from people who, who could really, really benefit. Great. Thank you. Well, we are running out of time now, so I think it's just, even though I've got still got quite a few questions that we'd love to go through, some a lot more polemic than, than the ones we've already had, but I think, I think we can wrap up and just go to everyone with, uh, just quickly, your final considerations based on everything that we've been able to, dis to talk about in the past one hour, 26 minutes. So let's go alphabetically. Andrea. You're mute. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to participate in this panel. It was really great meeting all of you that I haven't met yet personally and I've seen on the internet and, and uh, congratulating Kardec Group also for the work uh, that you have been doing disseminating spiritism. And I just wanted to uh, end with a message from Albert Schweitzer. He said a statement that stays with me a lot. Actually, two people, him and Karen Armstrong. He stated, I don't know what your future will be, but I know that truly happy uh, beings will be those who learn how to serve. And that's the basic um, teachings of Christ is to love one another as he loved us. It was the very last sentence that we have. And then finally, I just wanted to quote Karen Armstrong, who is a religious uh, author. She actually left the convent to to actually spread out the message of compassion. She created the Charter for Compassion. It's really worth it for us to go in and seek her in her books and her website. But she states that in current society today, we need to do something that is urgent, which is to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put someone else there, meaning pay attention to each other more and help one another because the COVID came and showed us a world that is very small, in which we found it finally, that it's our home that all of us partake in and no one was left aside. All of us were impacted in one way or another. As a message stating that it is a very small world and we do have a responsibility for ourselves and immediately towards our neighbors. And finally, I just wanted to say hi to Yvonne who's watching. So <laughs> that's, <all. laughs> that's great, thank you. And Yes, I, I also wanted to, to thank you for, for inviting me and uh, for being part of this panel. It's been really uh, helpful. I mean, I've learned a lot. Thank you all for your wisdom and your knowledge. And uh, we need to always be having conversations in order to grow and develop and not to be afraid to have different, uh, coming from different perspectives. Because uh, in the end, then we will meet somewhere along the line if we start to understand each other better. But at the end of the day, like I, I, I follow on from what Andrea just said, uh, words are words. It is our deeds that really make the difference at the end of the day. So whether we want to give ourselves labels or not, that's up to us. But what we do, that's which we'll be accountable for. So those are the thoughts that I really also take with myself this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Umberto. 
Oh, I, I think I could go forever <laughs> or, or stay uh, many more hours uh, for a, I took immense pleasure from this conversation. Uh, I think it was uh, both intellectually and uh, morally very inspiring. Um, and I, I think the essential uh, could be resumed uh, as something that Roberto just said uh, about uh, time as the filter that will show us uh, what uh, reality actually is. So um, since we, we do not know the truth, the ultimate truth, we are uh, just uh, making and, and launching uh, very uh, precarious uh, attempts to grasp reality. And that's the, the source of uh, religious conflict, of uh, philosophical debate and many sorts of dissension but uh, in order to, to, to bring humanity together in uh, one family um, that includes all diversity and at the same time produces harmony and, and well-being for, for everyone, we need the, the test uh, and, and, and the maturity that only will come with time and uh, I hope this uh, conversation uh, could also inspire others to uh, keep uh, in the dialogue, to, to uh, insist in the dialogue. Uh, also the dialogue between religions, religious traditions, between philosophical uh, currents or, or traditions uh, in order to uh, us uh, overcoming the, the many barriers that uh, we built in in, in uh, uh, misguided pursuit of, of 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 truth. Yeah, absolutely. And interfaith dialogue is something that yeah. might be coming up in maybe a, a few months' time. So thank you for that. And Roberto, let's go to you now for your last considerations. Yes, uh, I would like to thank you, Adam, for your invitation to participate in this conversation. Very interesting and very important these days. I think there is a concern in, in the Spiritism movement regarding this issue that you asked today. Is spirit in a religion or not? Some think that it's only moral and, uh, well, I, 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 may, I may look like an orthodox here, but uh, my concern is that if you if, if you take out the, the, the aspect of, a spirit, of a religion from the spirits, like uh, Emmanuel said, right, the, the triple aspect, the philosophy, science, and religion, then you have a, you, you may run the risk of uh, don't having the spiritism anymore, right? And in, in our concern by adapting spiritism to to people who, who, who don't like to hear about it, Jesus, God, and so on and so forth. It's easy to do that. It's just uh, you throw away the gospel according to spiritism, and then you have a spiritism as a moral, which is what you see in the spiritist book, right? But then you don't have spiritism anymore. So uh, very important what you brought today to the discussion, and I thank you for that. And thank you all for, thank for, you. for, for sharing your, your thoughts. No, thank you. Um, and so let's now finally go to Tanya. Thank you to everybody. Really, really good to hear the uh, diversity of views and to get the chance to, to share them. Um, I guess the, the hope that comes to my mind is, is that of convergence, that uh, where where things very much diverged and uh, diverged in very dramatic and at times very painful ways down through the centuries, that there there is an emerging convergence. And so um, I think each of us can approach uh, uh, knowledge, information, ideas and literature from spiritism in different ways. And uh that that openness and that uh growing convergence that i see as as psychology and science particularly uh grow and deepen in terms of their evidence base 
is represents for me a very very exciting opportunity to uh to help people move beyond taking on an article of faith to one of understanding why certain ideas were put forward as the key to a good and happy life uh and to seeing more the uh the growing evidence base around that and uh, certainly I have found within Spiritism um, uh, a number of very enlightening and beneficial elements that have um, uh, benefited me and uh, that I think could, um, yeah, can, can be of great benefit to others, but for each to, to approach in a way that is congruent for them. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, Really, it's just now for me to say thank you to everyone for taking part in the discussion today and to everyone who's been online with us. I know we didn't get a chance to say hello to people. We, we normally do. We do say hello to people normally, but we didn't get a chance to do that today. But no, we hope that this event has given everyone the opportunity to learn more about the different aspects and points of view regarding spiritism. and. We hope that everyone's got enough information to make up their own mind regarding this question. Is spiritism a religion? Because obviously, we, we're still not completely sure on the answer. So, if you're just a reminder that if you're interested in learning more about spiritism, no matter if you're just starting out or you want to learn a bit more or whatever, you know, you can, we'd like to invite you to come and talk to us here at Cardet Group. Obviously, there are many other organizations around the world but you know please come and talk to us here at Cardet group you know we're more than happy to talk to ev everyone from anywhere around the planet and just contact us via our website www.cardec.org.uk and we can get back to you as soon as we can and of course please remember to also follow us on social media um just look out for Cardec Group on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as visiting our website, like I just mentioned. So it just leaves me to say goodbye to everyone. And let's see if we can uh, bring everyone on. No, I think people just switched their, a couple of people switched their cameras off. Nope. Yep, let's bring bring everyone back on just to say, uh, if everyone waves a nice goodbye, so let's say goodbye to Andrea, to Anne, to Umberto, to Roberto and Tanya. Thank you all for being with us for this event today. And of course, thank you to everyone who's been watching us because without you, we wouldn't be doing this. And I'll leave you with this very last thought. And it's taken from Alan Kardec's speech in the December 1868 edition of Review Spiri. Spiritism, as we know, is the great lever of progress in all things. It marks an era of renovation. Let us therefore know how to wait, and let us not ask of an era more than it can give, like plants, ideas must ripen in order for us to reap their fruits. Let us also know how to make the necessary concessions in times of transition, for in nature, nothing happens suddenly and instantaneously. Well, that's it. Friends, my name is Adam Osborne, and it just we just hope that you can join us again next time for another episode of Insightfully Speaking where we'll be looking at the world from a spiritist perspective.